Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Landscape Bed Weed Control, brought to you by Landscape Management and our sponsor, Valent Professional Products. I'm Bethany Chambers from North Coast Media, publisher of Landscape Management Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available two weeks from today on our website at landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice in the lower left-hand corner of your console that there is a submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click submit to place your question in queue. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of Landscape Management Magazine or in our weekly e-newsletter, LM Direct. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue and Assistant Producer Diane Safranik or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Landscape Management Editor-in-Chief Marisa Palmieri. Thank you, Bethany, and welcome everyone to the first in a series of three Build Your Business webinars. Today's topic, as you know, is landscape bed weed management, and we have two great speakers lined up to cover both the technical and business sides of this in-demand and potentially lucrative service area. Also, uh, we have to thank our sponsor, Valent Professional Products, for making today's webinar possible, and I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. Jason Fossey uh, to say a few words. He's a regional field development manager for Valent. So, Jason? Well, thank you, Marissa. We at Valent Professional Products not only are manufacturers of SureGuard and BroadStart landscape herbicides, but we're excited about uh, sponsoring today's webinar. We feel the speakers have great presentations to share with the audience. And like I said, we're really excited about it today. Thanks, Jason. We appreciate it. First up is our technical speaker, Dr. Joe Neal from North Carolina State University. And uh, he's going to get started here in a moment. And just so you know, at the end, we'll have time for Q&A, as Bethany mentioned. And you can type those questions into the Q&A box, and, and we'll address them at the end. OK, I guess that's my cue. <laughs> this is Joe Neal. I'm a weed control specialist in uh, the Department of Horticultural Science at NC State University. And uh, today I'm going to try to give you a real overview of the principles and tools in landscape weed management. <clears throat> now to start out, I want to make sure that we're, we all understand that the tools we use in landscape weed control are going to be different depending on the type of plant materials uh, we have in the bed. So a woody landscape bed, you're going to have a lot more options available to you than if you have herbaceous plants like bulbs or bedding plants or herbaceous perennials in, this, in the bed. In order to make decisions based upon that knowledge, you need some resources. And so, of course, um, I'm going to suggest that one place you can get those resources uh, is my website, where we um, we have a lot of a lot of materials that I've developed for courses, fact sheets. Um, for example, on my website there I have a whole class, a whole course in landscape weed management that will go into so much more. Uh, detail than we're going to cover today. So if you want more information and more detail about some of the things that I'm talking to today, uh, then uh, you could visit my website and go to those, those courses as well as the fact sheets that I have there. Now, this gives you a bit of an outline of what I want to cover. In landscape weed management, it's a system where we start with sanitation and then site preparation mulches, pre-emergent herbicides, post-emergent herbicides, and of course, you're never going to get away from that hand weeding. There will always be some. 
but our overall goal is to come up with a landscape weed management plan that minimizes the cost and time that you spend hand weeding. Well, let's start with sanitation. This is, an, this is something that is underappreciated as a weed management tool. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you see a picture of a rather unimpressive little weed. And this is, this is mulberry weed. But if you're familiar with some of the old Star Trek episodes, if you remember the trouble with tribbles, and Doc uh, replied to the question of what makes tribbles tick, you know, he answered, Captain Kirk, I think they're born pregnant. So this is uh, kind of the tribble of the plant world. This plant is, uh, is able to go to seed by the time it reaches two inches in height. So by the time it reaches the second leaf stage, it can be producing seed in 12 days. So we have a lot of weeds in landscape management that are able to produce, weed, produce seeds when they are very young. Additionally, they have an ability to spread themselves like oxalis. We're all familiar with that. It shoots its seed all over the place. Well, it can shoot its seed six, eight feet. So weeds that are growing in the lawn area shoot their seed into the landscape bed and back and forth. Okay. So weeds spread, but we also move weeds into landscape beds by some of our actions. Now weeds are going to get there by many, many um, mechanisms, okay, but uh, our actions move some of our most difficult to control weeds, such as the mugwort you see in the bald and burlapped tree in this uh, photograph. Mugwort, well, I should back up just a moment, just about every infestation of mugwort in a landscape bed can be traced back to a bald and burlap tree or shrub that was planted in the landscape, and from there it spread. So sanitation from the point of inspecting the, the, the plants that you bring into the landscape, cleaning your equipment from one job site to the other, um, you know, knowing where your organic amendments and your soils, topsoil that you bring into a site, knowing where they come from, and knowing if the commercial vendor is doing a good job of managing their storage sites can help you prevent the introduction of some difficult to control weeds. Now we're always going to have some weeds on, on site. All right? And the best time to control your really difficult weeds is before you plant the bed. Okay? In an ideal situation, we're going to try to manage those weeds before before you, you plant, such as Bermuda grass or mugwort, nut sedges, try to eradicate them before you get, uh, get your ornamentals into the beds. Now, how do we go about doing that? Well, there, there are actually quite a few, are quite a few options available, but the one that is most practical is the one we're most familiar with, and that's using glyphosate uh, to, to treat these um, <clears throat> excuse me, to treat the weeds before you plant your landscape plants. Now, I should say that uh, there is interest in using solarization to prepare sites. In the south, where you've got nice, sunny, hot weather, solarization can be used, and it takes six to eight weeks of covering the soil with clear plastic, most homeowners and, and commercial properties don't really want to wait that long. All right, so it's, while it can be used to control a lot of annual weeds, it's just not practical for most situations. Okay. Um, it looks like I'm... Okay, it looks like some of the slides did not advance with my previous clicks. Let me just catch up here, there. Okay, now I'm on the site preparation slide. Moving forward with glyphosate, when we're using glyphosate for our site preparation, one of the most important things to remember is that 
the timing will make a difference. Now, glyphosate is essentially non-selective, so it's going to kill most plants. It is systemic, so it translocates from the leaves to the roots and gives you very good kill of most perennials. Okay. Um, since it is systemic, it needs a little time to get to the roots. So when you're doing some site preparation for a new bed, you want to give it time to work. Give it at least five days to translocate. Now, if you've used Roundup, and most of you have, or glyphosate, I should say, you know that the weed is not dead within five days. But it has already translocated to the roots. You can go ahead and rototill that bed and amend it and prepare it after five days. It is best to wait until the weeds are fully dead and starting to uh, decompose before you till the bed. But you can get in as soon as five days without reducing the uh, effectiveness of the treatment. Now, it will control most perennial weeds but there are always going to be some that are not controlled. Things like yellow nutsedge will come back from the tubers and the rhizo and rhizomes. Things like mugwort will have incomplete control. And you, if you have those really difficult to control weeds in the site, you will need to plan to come back and, and continue to monitor and manage those weeds over time. Okay. <clears throat> so those weeds are going to return. So we have to have a plan in place to control not just those weeds, but also the weeds that are be, will be coming back from the seed that's in the soil or the seed that's going to blow in. And for that, we want to talk about pre-emergence. So treatments that, we, that go out before weeds emerge. Now, our first and best defense against annual weeds coming in from seed is a good mulch. A good, clean mulch will eliminate most of our annual weeds. Well, what kind of mulch is, is the best one? Basically, from a weed control perspective, it doesn't matter. How, weeds, how mulches work is to cover the soil to cover the soil and prevent sunlight from getting to the seed because those seeds require light to germinate. Most weed seeds require light to germinate. So you can be using lava rocks, you can be using pine bark, you can be using some of those designer wood products. And I'll, I say that, you know, knowing, and the audience should know that I really, really dislike those products from an aesthetic perspective. I encourage them all to look to more natural products. But if your customer likes the look of the designer products, then I guess the customer is right. And from a weed control perspective, they all work. Now, what makes a good mulch? Besides being aesthetically pleasing, it should be relatively coarse textured. Uh, so that it dries out. It should not wash. Now, again, pine bark nuggets are a beautiful, long-lasting mulch, but they will wash very easily on a slope. Okay, so if, you're go if your customer wants those, then you need to think about the site and how you're going to stabilize that mulch so it doesn't wash in into the sidewalks and the driveways and the lawn areas. I had a neighbor who loved that mulch so much that he would come after every good summer thunderstorm, he would come down to my driveway and shovel up all his mulch and take it back to his yard because every time it rained, it would wash out of his beds and down his driveway and gather at my driveway. So he loved it. He maintained it. Uh, but it was not the most practical solution for his site where there was a slope. Okay. I've also seen it used at commercial properties like malls, shopping centers, and it's not a great choice there because it washes out into the sidewalks so frequently. So very important to consider from a practical perspective. Now, what else makes a good mulch? It should not be phytotoxic. Now, what do I really mean by that? Is if a mulch pile is left 
for a period of time, for several weeks, and you don't turn that mulch, it will go anaerobic down in the middle, and when organic materials start decomposing under anaerobic conditions, that's without oxygen, they produce some pretty nasty compounds. And in this photograph, you'll see the leaves of this Gerber daisy have been burned by the mulch that was spread around it. And these alkaloids and alcohols will literally burn up tender plants like bedding plants. How do you know if that's the case? You can smell it. It's, a mulch has been anaerobically decomposing. It stinks. It doesn't have that fresh, earthy smell that good compost or good mulch has. It's going to, going to be stinky. And if it smells that way, you really should not use it. Okay. Most good commercial mulch suppliers manage their mulch piles so that you should not see this. But you run into this sometimes if a load of mulch is delivered to a job site and it sits there for several weeks because you've been delayed for a reason. If that happens, get your tractor in there, turn that mulch pile, get to the bottom and turn the bottom to the top and let Mother Nature air it out for a couple of weeks before you use it. And the other thing, this probably is not quite as much of an issue in your region, but here in the south, we worry about pine straw also. We found over the years that pine straw actually stunts the growth of pansies. So for example, in this photograph, you can see the, the pansy plants on the left have filled in and are touching each other, but you can see the spaces between the plants on the right and the pine straw mulch bed. We found that pine straw stunts pansy growth and reduces flowering by about 20%. We don't know why, but we do know this happens. Okay, so the landscapers in the south will install pansy beds with more of this plan. They use a very fine textured compost in the bed for annual weed suppression and then edge the beds with the pine straw and that actually prevents the washing of the mulch out into lawn areas or onto sidewalks. Okay. We don't see this stunting with other bedding plants. So your summer bedding plants, your petunias and your begonias and your impatiens, we do not see pine straw stunting them or pine bark stunting them. But uh, with the pansies and violas, that is one thing we do see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so how much mulch do we say? In a woody landscape bed, uh, you need three... The research shows you need three to four inches of mulch for the most effective weed control. Less than two inches and you've got a lot of weeds. If you decide to use a geotextile fabric in addition to a, a mulch, then you cut way back on the amount of mulch you put on top of that geotextile fabric. Just, a, just enough mulch to make sure the geotextile fabric is covered so that sunlight doesn't get to it. What about color beds? Okay. If you're working in color beds, you want a thinner layer of mulch. You want an organic mulch layer that's relatively fine textured so that you can just till that into the soil at the end of the season and contribute that back to the soil as organic material. Say. So we don't use inorganic mulches like brick chips and rocks if you're going to be transitioning color beds. And we generally do not use geotextile fabrics in those situations either. Okay, rule of thumb, how much mulch do you need in a landscape bed? This is a rule of thumb to get you started. One cubic yard covers about 100 square feet to a depth of 3 inches, and that's of a shredded bark. Uh, in the south, again, we use a lot of pine straw, and we find that one bale covers about 35 square feet. A uh, question that was raised, will pine nuggets also stunt pansies? The jury's out on that. Uh, we've done those comparisons a few times, and twice we saw no effect on the pansies. The third time we did it, we saw about a 15% reduction in growth in the pansies uh, with pine mini nuggets. So I wish I had a clear 
and concise answer to you on that one, but um, but I don't. Most of the time, we don't see a reduction in growth. All right, so when to mulch? Obviously, late winter, early spring, before plants start to, to flush out. As in this photograph, it's a whole lot easier to, to mulch around that hosta before it has established its new spring growth. So um, the best time is in late winter, early spring, right about the time that you're planning to put your pre-emergence herbicides on before your summer weeds germinate. Okay, So it's going to work, work better in terms of weed control, and it's going to be easier to get it out in the landscape bed uniformly. Now, no matter how good a job we do with site preparation, with our mulching, there always are going to be some weeds. And sometimes we need to think about herbicides. We have pre-emergence herbicides that control weeds when they're applied before weeds emerge. And after weeds come up, we have post-emergence herbicides. So let's first start talking about pre-emergence herbicides. How do they work? Pre-emergence herbicides lay down a barrier in the soil, right at the surface of the soil, because most of our weeds germinate in the top half inch of the soil. Most of them germinate there. And so our pre-emergence herbicides, when they're applied to the soil surface and watered in, they create that herbicide-treated zone, like you see on the right-hand side of the screen. And any of the weeds germinating within that zone will absorb the herbicide and stop the root or the shoot from growing. If the weed germinates from deeply in the soil, like some of our large seeded weeds like uh, velvet leaf can germinate for several inches down in the soil. Those can sometimes push right through that herbicide treated barrier. So we have some of the weeds like morning glory and velvet leaf that are more difficult to control. The herbicides work on them, but the plants just avoid the herbicide by germinating from deep in the soil and pushing through. Sometimes this is you can look at this as positional selectivity. And we use this in landscape beds. So imagine, if you will, instead of weeds, we're talking about ornamental plants that have their root systems established in the ground. And we apply this herbicide, and it's right on the surface. So right on the surface it is preventing weeds from growing, but it does not prevent the roots of your ornamental plants from growing down below that zone. We call that positional selectivity. There are many herbicides available for use in landscapes. Over 20 active ingredients are registered for use in landscapes. Most of these are also labeled for use in turf, but there are exceptions. The majority of the herbicides that we use in landscape beds have at least one of their active ingredients is in the dinitroaniline herbicide class of chemistry. The dinitroanilines are very familiar products to you. If you've been working in this industry for any amount of time, you know these herbicides. They're Barricade, Pendulum, Treflan. Surflan. They are all dinitroaniline herbicides and, and are very similar in how they behave and the kinds of weeds they control. They control grasses really well. They control oxalis or wood sorrel very well. They control spurge really well. But other broadleaf weeds are not quite as good on. So other products are on the market that control broadleaf weeds, specifically Gallery was labeled for broadleaf weed control, and that has become a standard when you put Gallery with one of the dinitroaniline herbicides. You get these combination products, such as Snapshot, which is a Gallery plus Treflan to give you broadleaf and grass control at the same time. 
So you'll see on the market there are lots of combinations such as that that give you a broader spectrum of weed control. Overall, even though there are a lot of products available as sprayable formulations or as granular formulations, when you're talking about using these herbicides in landscape beds, the granules are generally preferred for the plant safety and the convenience. The biggest challenge when you've got that many products to choose from is choosing the right product. First and foremost, you need to choose a herbicide that you know is going to be safe on the ornamental plants in your landscape bed. And this is very complicated when you have a large diversity of ornamental plants in the, uh, in the bed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you've got woody ornamentals, okay, you've got lots of choices. You can use broad spectrum herbicides like Broadstar, SureGuard, Snapshot, Surflan, Gallery. Okay. You can even sometimes use Casseron to control some perennial weeds. Okay. But if you've got herbaceous plants, the sensitivity to the herbicides is, uh, is more important for you to consider. And the tolerance for herbicides between the species varies tremendously. So how do you know which ones are safe? Well, there are fact sheets, and if you go to my website or just very easily, if you want a fact sheet on what herbaceous, what herbicides you can use on bedding plants, uh, type this into Google, horticulture information leaflet number 644, and you will find a fact sheet specifically on that. Or go to my website, and we have a large table on what herbicides are registered for use in herbaceous ornamentals. And that would include herbaceous perennial beds as well. And they are very sensitive to herbicides. So what would you find when you go looking for that? You're going to find tables such as this one that show the, uh, the ornamental plants and then the, herb the herbicides for which, uh, which are registered for those plants. And what does that mean, registered or labeled? If a species is registered or labeled, or labeled, or a herbicide is labeled for that species, that means the company says that herbicide is safe. If it's not listed on the label, it may or may not be safe. There are no guarantees there. But So what does it mean? Once you've selected a product based upon safety, you, you want to choose one that's effective. The effect Grasses, grassy weeds are generally easy to control. Okay, just about all of the pre-emergence herbicides on the market control your crabgrass and annual bluegrass pre-emergence. Broadleaf weeds are more difficult. Sedge control is even more of a challenge. Okay, I mentioned the dinitroaniline herbicides specifically because they are the backbone of our industry's pre-emergence weed control. Okay, so dinitroaniline herbicides control most of our annual, our most common weeds, crabgrass, oxalis, chickweed, spurge, if they're applied before weeds germinate. So here's an example of a chart of the comparison of pre-emergence herbicides on some of our annual weeds. So for example, you'll see the annual grasses, you get lots of good uh, green means good in this chart. So good weed control of annual grasses like crabgrass from Surfland, Barricade, Pendulum, Snapshot, Freehand, Pennant Magnum, Broadstar in our region can controls the, uh, the grasses for not quite as long. Uh, versus the broadleaf weeds, you'll see that Broadstar is picking up the broadleaf weeds uh, very good, but the dinitroaniline, Surfland, Barricade, Pendulum, they're not going to be quite as good on something like bittercress. Chickweed, they all work well. Spurge, they all work well. There's some variation there with horseweed. But over there on the far right-hand side, you see nutsedge. So if you've got yellow nutsedge, you know that it's more difficult to control and you have fewer products available that provide suppression when applied pre-emergence. And you can use these tables to help you select the most appropriate product 
for the weeds that you have on site. Keeping in mind something like yellow nut sedge, you have the fewer options available. Specifically, there are only pennant magnum, tower, or freehand that give you yellow nut sedge suppression when applied pre-emergence. Okay, with your pre-emergence weed control, okay, timing is everything. Applications must be made about two weeks before germination, and that depends on the life cycle of the weed. So if it's a summer annual, you want your applications out in late winter. For winter annual weed control, an application in late summer or early fall is what you want to do. So again, a typical calendar for pre-emergence weed control, mulch, pre for summer annual uh, weeds in the winter, late spring or early summer. If you have nut sedge in beds, you'll need a second application in late spring or early summer. And then in late summer or early fall, another pre-emergence treatment for winter annual weeds. All right, I'm going to give you the real quick story on post-emergence weed control. You're always going to have some weeds coming through, whether annual or perennial, so you're going to have some labor. And that labor needs to be trained. This is a true story. Here's our department head saying, well, golly, that looked like a weed to me. This is a true story. Our floriculture specialist had just planted those plants. So train your employees, particularly in annual beds, perennial beds, recognize what uh, weed which plant is a weed and which one you need to control. In landscape beds, if you have grassy weeds, whether it's crabgrass or quackgrass, we can control those with selective herbicides, Envoy, Fusillade, Segment, and sometimes you can use a claim. A claim works on crabgrass, but in general, in landscape beds, Envoy, Fusillade, and Segment are your three go-to products for selective grass control. So it's basically spray right over the top of most broadleaf ornamentals with these products and control your crabgrass or your uh, quack grass or Bermuda grass. Okay, Envoy is the only one that controls annual bluegrass. It works slowly in cool weather, but it does work. The other two products do not control the annual bluegrass. Okay. Now I say these products are labeled for uh, application over the top of ornamentals, okay? but be aware that the selectivity is not perfect. Okay? The, these products have some varieties and some species of ornamentals that they can injure. In this image you can see a blue rug juniper. What was thought to be blue rug turned out to be Bar Harbor. So if you have any trouble telling the difference between blue rug and bar harbor juniper, you could spray it with fusillade and you will damage the bar harbor. So that's one way that I know how to tell these things apart. Okay, now that is supposed to be a joke, folks, so I assume that you know that. Uh, do not spray your blue rug junipers with the fusillade. Choose one of the other products that, that does not have the warning on the label about your ground cover junipers. Okay. Envoy or segment could be used in that situation safely. Okay. For broadleaf weed control, there are a few options out there, but generally, you know, uh, we're going to use something like glyphosate to control broadleaf weeds. And so, in using a non selective herbicide like glyphosate in landscape beds, I should, you know, I've glossed over some of the other options. There are contact herbicides, there are finale or glufosinate. There are situations where these products are useful, okay? But most of the applications are going to be made with glyphosate because it is a systemic herbicide. It's going to control the, the shoots and the roots. Contact herbicides are just going to burn the foliage that they touch. So a contact herbicide may be an advantage from that standpoint around ornamentals. Your injury is not systemic. Okay, but you know, with uh, with glyphosate, there are lots and lots of products on the market. Are there differences among them? Very slight differences. 
There are combinations of Roundup Plus Diquat or Roundup Plus Scythe on the market that give you a rapid burn down. Landscapers like them because there's good uh, customer satisfaction with the knowledge that you've done it, you've seen the results very quickly, but if you're really going after some tough weeds where you really need the translocation of the glyphosate down into the roots, into the root systems, stick with a straight glyphosate application, okay? Uh, but for general weed control, those combinations that give you a more rapid burn down will work fine. Now here we are at the section where it's do what I say, not what I do. Remember glyphosate is systemic, so once you've sprayed an area, don't walk through it. Yes, that's my boot print you're looking at. Don't drag the hose through the area, and that's what you see on the left-hand side. Hopefully you can see that yellow stripe through that lawn. Yes, that's my backyard. And on the right-hand side, yes, that's my trail where I had a leak in the back of my backpack. Fortunately, I had spray dye marker in the sprayer, and I could actually see that I had a, I had a leak. All right, so if you're using these non-selective herbicides, obviously you want to use them in ways that you're not going to kill your ornamentals. You can direct the spray away from ornamentals. You can use a wiper to apply glyphosate if your weeds are taller than ground covers. And you can even use uh, clippers to apply glyphosate uh, to, say, a, a small woody plant that's growing in a shrub bed. You can dip the clippers in some glyphosate and clip the weed right at the base. Uh, and that actually works quite well to control vines and woody weeds that are growing up in landscape beds. You may have customers that prefer non-chemical or, uh, or organic approaches, and there are products available like vinegar. Keep in mind it's a contact type product, so not translocated, so you will have to come back and use it again and again. Flame weeders are an option, and, uh, but just remember, flame weeders are probably great for hardscapes, but around organic materials and organic edges, uh, <clears throat> you can have a fire hazard. So again, from a commercial perspective, you need to be careful with the use of these products. Now, if you want a commercial scale uh, material or, or strategy, there is hot foam and steam. Uh, there are hot foam and steam systems available. Shown here is the Waipuna hot foam weed control. It produces a foaming action that envelops the weeds, and it works quite well, but it is very expensive. The equipment costs are high. Uh, but uh, for sites and municipalities that want a non-chemical option, this is something that, that some municipalities have been using. So that is the rapid fire overview of weed management in landscape beds. I didn't get into a whole lot of specifics, but if you have, if you need specific information, go to my website. I do have some fact sheets there, and I see that we do have some questions, but I'm going to hold on that until the end of our sessions, and hopefully there will be some time for me to respond to some of those specific questions at the end. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Joe. That was all great information, very informative, and uh, hopefully we'll get to some of those questions at the end. Up next is Phil Fogarty, owner of Weedman of Euclid, Ohio, near Cleveland and also of Crowley's Vegetation Management. And Phil is going to give us some insight on the business side of incorporating landscape bed weed control into your lawn care or landscape maintenance business. So Phil, uh, kicking it over to you. Great, Marissa. Thanks. And uh, boy, thanks, Joe. That, that's a, a great, uh, the, the extension folks are such great uh, resources for us. And, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and I was taking notes along with you and, and uh, getting some updated, updated information. So thanks very much for that, and uh, thanks to Landscape Management and Valen for getting this conversation started. So, um, okay, well, I, I'm, my part of this is to talk a little bit about 
the business part of it, why you would do this and how you would make money at it or why it's a good business proposition for folks in the green industry. And I, I looked, glanced at the, uh, the number of people that were on. There's a couple hundred people on this call, and an awful lot of them are landscape management and, and uh, design build folks. And for the design build folks that are out there, hearing Joe talk about uh, site preparation and the, the selection of plants and, and knowing what you're going to put in, into the bed is one way to certainly prevent some of the weed issues you're going to have. For a design build person, I could see this being a great way to add value to the customer if when you leave the site, you've already got it treated and prevented for weeds with some of these applications and offering a service that's going to go on after you've done the installation. For landscape management folks, you're probably looking to reduce the hours that you've got on a site. And you know, for the lawn care folks here, you might be looking at this as a way to diversify your business. Well, um, from from my perspective, no matter which one of those reasons why you're on this call, besides to get the technical information from Joe, you also should be looking at this as a business proposition. And if, if it's to add a, a, a part of your business uh, for your current customers to have another service from you, then it's clear who the customer is. If you're doing this internally, then you're your own customer. And no matter how you do it, you want to look at it as uh, a business decision about whether or not this is going to be viable for your business. Is it, is it good? Does it fit? So the, the first thing you have to do is look at it from a business planning standpoint. Weed Man has uh, taught me a, a great business planning system, and that's what we're known for. And every decision we make in our businesses is always based in a plan where we, we look at what the demand for the service is, we look at what... Uh, is gonna, it's going to take to feed that marketplace and to, to service that marketplace, and then look at all the expenses it's going to take to do that. So first and foremost, you've got to decide whether or not this is a, something that's going to fit for the culture of your business. Are you mostly a residential company? Are you mostly a, des uh, a, a commercial company, or are you doing mostly design build? And how is it going to, to fit with how you do training, how you hire people, and how you take care of business on a day-to-day -day basis. All of these services, all the things that Joe talked about, are all done best if they're put into a program of service. And I'll talk a little bit more about the program here in a, in a, in a few minutes. But think of it in terms of a regular recurring thing that's going to happen on your customer base or on your property. We, uh, one of the accounts we've had over the years is uh, uh, we have a couple of local theme parks. One of them was SeaWorld when SeaWorld was in Cleveland. And even with a staff of people taking care of their beds, they still hired us to do a regular trip through with these products to try and reduce their, their labor. So you, you want to always look at this as if you're going to be on the property to try and prevent the, the problems because otherwise, looking at the bed I've got in the, the slide here, you can see that there's going to be a constant demand for the service and you're going to always be trying to catch up. What people are expecting is a weed-free bed area. So whether you're doing it for yourself or for a customer, think of it in terms of a program of services. So okay, why is this a great opportunity? One of the reasons why is because you have a chance to have border-to-border -border control over your customer's property. Joe mentioned that some weeds shoot seeds uh, feet away from where they are. Oxalis is another one that shoots seeds out into landscape beds from the lawn and into the lawn from the landscape beds. The customers that we have that we are doing lawn care and bed weed control for, we have less service calls on both sides because we're in control of where those weed seeds are going to come from and how the beds and how the lawn are combined. It's a great benefit for us and it's a great benefit for the customer. And we've become irreplaceable to our customers. These folks that have both services for us, from us don't shop us. We're one of the only people that will offer this service in our marketplace to be able to provide them weed control in their beds, which oftentimes is much more of a pain for them to do uh, the work in than the lawn, is, makes us an irreplaceable lawn care company. There aren't other lawn care companies they can call to get both services done at the same time. Um, again, if you're your own customer, you're, off, you're, you're trying to reduce the labor on the property, but factoring in how much the costs are for the, for the equipment, the products, and the, uh, also the, uh, 
um, the time it's going to take you to train someone and find someone and pay someone a little bit higher wage to make sure you've got someone on site that knows the, the plant material involved and knows how to do the techniques of this are all things you're going to factor in in your business planning about whether or not you would do this service. But typically, you're going to be able to reduce your labor some, but more than anything, you're going to be able to do things more efficiently, even if it's a push with how much money it costs you to have this extra person on site, on, on staff, and have the knowledge and have the equipment and have the products, you will be able to do a better job and stay ahead of these weed problems more efficiently. So you may have a double win, but even if it's a push on the money, you're going to be better at the job. So where to begin is uh, uh, always it's with a sale. Things, uh, no matter what, you have to have the, the demand for the service and so if you're doing this as another way to serve your customers or a way to go out and get new customers, then you, you've got to make a sale first before you're able to do this. If you're doing it in-house, then you've made the decision that you're your own customer and you're going to take care of your beds as this service line develops within your company. If you have a current customer base, that's obviously the first place to go. They already trust you to do things. They already um, believe you can do the job. They see you as an applicator or someone to take care of the property. And so to add this service on, it's a natural, and that's where we've grown our side, this side of our business for sure is out of the cross-selling opportunity. The standalone service opportunity for this is, I think, bigger in some markets than it is in others. Um, first of all, I think if you've got a predominance of people that you're serving that have a do-it-yourself mentality when possible, um, which is, I think, what a lot of lawn care uh, folks, when you're doing lawn care applications for someone, they need to be mowing their own lawn, planting their own flowers, and, and doing their own uh, landscape maintenance. So it's a natural for us to be able to help them reduce their hours and take something that has some expertise to it and add that to the service line. If you're um, doing a standalone service in markets like, uh, oh, the southwest where you've got a lot of xeriscaping, um, I had a long conversation with a, uh, someone in that market uh, down in New Mexico the other day about how they were going to take lawn care thinking, lawn care marketing, and apply it to making a series of steps to take care of the xeriscaping that's in their neighborhoods, that's taken over the lawn areas that they have. And there's a lot of xeriscaping in commercial landscapes as well that would make it more apt for you to be able to go do this line of service because there's not a lot of maintenance to it except for the spraying and the preventing of weeds in those beds. It's not as technical when you've got a zero escaping area and the demand is actually clearer that you could be of service with these products and services. To find the prospects, I think your, your best bet is the people that are already out in the, in the uh, neighborhoods or on these properties to begin with. So that's where some of the cross training gets involved, making sure that you've got applicators, uh, folks working on your landscape crews, and um, anyone in your company looking out for the opportunities to do these services. And it's easy in June and July when you see people start to have big weed problems, they obviously haven't got the knowledge to take care of this ahead of time. And a well-placed phone call or, or a, a flyer in the door is a perfect way to get new business. We do a lot of telemarketing still within our uh, company to check in with our customers. If we've got 4,000 customers uh, in our operation here, uh, telemarketing that base of people to see if they would like us to add this service on is a natural way to, to go about this. We also utilize any invoices we're leaving or mailings we go out. We never put any piece of mail or anything in the customer's hands without there being some marketing as well. and so. You're never going to give someone just a bill ever, even for the landscape management folks that are mailing a bill once a month. Utilizing that connection and that contact with the customer to just give them a bill is wasting a great sales opportunity. And that's a chance to, to remind them of other things that you do. And uh, whether it's landscape bed weed control or it's tree and shrub applications, utilizing the contacts you have with your customers already to remind them of the things that you're doing is a natural way to do this. So I talked about the, the uh, business planning part of this, and that, of course, includes budgeting for it. You're going to have a front-end loaded cost uh, on this service. The preventatives are much more expensive than the, than the post-emergent applications. 
And so you're going to spend more money on the front end with customers than you are um, as you go through the year. So you want to prevent customers from just taking one application or the first application because most of the expense is going to be on that front end. Creating a program that allows them to, to spread it out over a number of applications is a great service to the customer, but it may not be good for your cash flow. Just keep it in mind when you make the decision on how you're going to price for it and how you're going to budget for it. Staffing, you really need someone who has some plant knowledge. Joe talked about the, the people that pulled the plants out of the ground that had just been planted. And likewise, when, when they're creating perennials that are hybrid dandelions and expecting someone to know that that was planted and was a gift from grandma and it got planted in the bed and then your, your staff person showed up there, saw a dandelion in the bed and sprayed it, is a pretty, it's a pretty um, tough order to know exactly what's a weed and what's not, especially when you have things just emerging out of the ground before they're fully formed, you wouldn't even know unless you're looking for patterns or have some experience at understanding what these plants look like. So you can't send your average guy out there to do this application. You've got to be staffed for this with someone who has knowledge. I'm going to t uh, show a little bit uh, of some of the equipment that we use. And getting this work done, you're, you really have to have technique and equipment that's right for the job and be, have people that are trained on how to use it well. So, um, okay, so you're, you're uh, on the customer side, you're, you're creating the right expectations when you're, when you're looking at how you're going to develop this program. Joe talked about there's always going to be the need for hand pulling. You cannot get around it. There will always be a need for if there's other plants in that bed, you're going to need to have, let them have the expectation that they're still going to have to pull a weed or two. If a weed is growing up right through uh, a blue rug juniper, for example, as, as Joe talked about them as well, or if it's coming up through uh, an azalea or right near the, the drip line or the, the uh, canopy of a Japanese maple that is uh, all the way down to the ground, a nice cut leaf, very expensive plant, you don't want to be spraying that close to a plant or you can't spray through a plant like that without damaging the plants you want to keep. So the customer has to have the right expectations that there's still going to be some labor involved, but you can cut it by 80, 90 percent. And as each year goes by, you build um, up in the beds a chance to, to reduce the seed bank, and you'll have less and less of that. Oftentimes when they pull weeds out in the open, you can actually, they're proliferating some of the weeds, things that have very rhizotomous uh, growing patterns, things like thistle or things like... Uh, uh, horsetail. When you pull them, a lot of times you're creating more. Nuts edge, you leave that little nutlet in the ground and you're creating more opportunity for us. So we tell the customer as much as we know you're going to have to pull a weed here or there near a plant or one that's growing through a plant, we tell them please don't pull a plant that's out in the open. Call us and let us spray it so that we can reduce the seed bank and reduce the recurrence of the weed by getting it root and all. And then that, that recurring uh, of us showing up four or five times a year and then also showing up year to year not only creates a better situation for the customer and um, we're preventing and we're keeping the, the weeds at bay, but also it creates a great regular recurring revenue stream as well. That's what I love about the lawn care business is that there is uh, not only several pre-planned visits to someone's house and we can uh, route that and we can plan that really well so we're efficient, keep the cost down for the customer, and also uh, be very, very efficient with our costs so we're more profitable. On top of that, you go from year to year with a customer and 80% of those people will come back to you year over year, and so you build your business faster that way. Same thing with bed weed control. We're on a property four to five times a year, and the, re the re renewal rate of people on it is 90% because they once they have us on the property doing these services, they won't they just won't live without it, and that's the way it is with commercial as well. Once you start doing these on your own properties or on commercial properties, you'll see how much more easy, how much less labor you have in maintaining it. And I mentioned the front end uh, loaded expenses. So I want to just talk a little bit about equipment and technique here. Um, we use uh, a belly grinder, we call it. Uh, to do this. This is an old farming piece of equipment that's uh, used so you can walk around the bed and not have to, you obviously can't walk a spreader 
through a bed when there's flowers and ground covers and, and landscape plants. This allows you the mobility to put down the, pre the preventatives, the pre-emergent herbicides that you want to put down, and you're walking through them very agilely, and you're depositing the, the right amount through uh, the use of a spreader like this. There's also the spraying part of things. Is This is different techniques than being out on a lawn. Joe showed you the, the hose that he pulled through the lawn, and, and to avoid that, we always use backpacks in the beds unless it's a huge commercial application. And the landscape, when you've got a backpack sprayer, again, you're very agile walking through there, not having to worry about pull, pulling a hose around a plant that could be contaminated. That hose could be contaminated and it could damage a plant. But we're walking through with a backpack or a handheld. What you do not want to do is have your technician over-pressurizing that because now you've got, if he pumps it up all the way, you've got a nice cloud vaporizing through the air, and the Roundup touching other things is obviously not a good idea. So here's a, an example of someone who um, oversprayed the edge, and most likely it, it could have been wind that day that you we, we shouldn't have been out there because it was too windy in an open area. It could have been the overpressurized his his spray can or, or backpack, and it, it resulted in an overspray. You always want to put yourself between the, the, what you're hoping not to hit, so you're shielding anything that you don't want to. So you should have been walking along that edge and spraying into the bed with him between the lawn and the bed with a, a very low-pressurized backpack and, or, or a handheld and uh, making sure he was watching the wind. So training on this is, is really important besides having someone that understands it. In addition to, to the technique and the product or the uh, equipment you're going to use, on top of that, you kind of have to, there's some, some tricks to the trade. For one, Joe talked about annuals being uh, a little bit sensitive to this. We found by the hard way that Mother Nature is still a little bit in control here when you know that uh, those funny things like two different kinds of junipers have different reactions. Um, in our case, uh, we found uh, red tulips twisted, um, and uh, we're twisting from the use of isoxabin. So you have to be very careful where there's going to be certain types of flowers, and in particular, annual flowers don't like preventatives. You'll stunt the growth of the, of the annuals if you don't watch out there, so mark out those areas. And there was a question presented already about the... Uh, some of the hard to control weeds like thistle. We use a crop oil to, to cut through the cuticle, the hairy cuticle of a, of a uh, plant like a, a thistle. And so that's gonna, uh, that's gonna be one way that you're gonna be more effective than the homeowner knowing some tricks of the trade like putting in spreader stickers and things that are gonna get you through the cuticle of the plant. These, these products always work if they get into the plant. And that's some of the, the ways we do it in our program. So I'm running out of time here, so I just want to rapidly go through a couple of things here to, to wrap up. Um, you want to make sure that you create a clear program for the customer. Four to five visits throughout the year, preventatives spaced out throughout the year, and you're using a combination of products like Nuts Edge Control, uh, Roundup, or glyphosate type products um, combined in the tank so that you're walking through in one pass getting, getting rid of all of the weeds that are in that bed. Your marketing material has to be very clear so that you're setting the right expectations and your sales staff has to know how to set the right expectations so that the customer knows there's going to be a weed or two and that uh, they need to alert you when there's weeds out in the open. You, of course, have to have the right staff and training them, you know, the application techniques that I talked about, and knowing your numbers so that you know how much money uh, is going into your application program. We typically are around $400 for a four-application program. That's our average cost, and of course that would vary from the size of the landscape bed. But our program of services is typically four applications and it runs just shy of $400 a customer for those visits with service calls in between being free. So okay, well I, I, I uh, hope there's time for some questions, and I know that there's been a few put in queue and also a few submitted earlier, so let's go to those. Thank you very much, Phil. That was that was great. That was very engaging and informative. Um, one question for you to start off: um, Do you use the same? Um, is it the same tech that's servicing the lawn as servicing the beds? If you have an account that has both, or is that a separate tech on a separate route? 
Well, great, great question. And I, I've learned this one also the hard way, so I can hopefully save someone uh, some grief. Not only do we use different, a different technician uh, or at least a different truck, and it's a different visit from a, a, a technician. It may be the same technician, but only if he's cross-trained. We do not have these products on our lawn care trucks or our tree care trucks. It is a separate thing because as Joe showed you a footprint, you don't want to have someone walking through a landscape bed and then walking through someone's lawn without having um, changed their shoes or at least taken a different route out of the, the lawn. There's just too many things that could go wrong, and so we always have a separate crew go out with the landscape uh, products like Roundup or, or glyphosate, um, and also they have the, that, that equipment is, is sequestered in our operation. You don't have... Uh, backpacks going back and forth from Roundup to broadleaf weed control for the lawns. We don't have hoses that go back and forth or tanks that go back and forth or tip and fills that go back and forth. Everything is dedicated to landscape that weed control because it does not obviously mix with lawn care. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to get to a few technical questions that people have been chatting in about. So, so what is the best way to kill ivy? Okay, I guess I guess Joe that's or, a question for me, I would think. I, I think Joe, so, yeah. Yes, Joe, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, we've actually done research on that. Um, I assume we're talking about English ivy. And uh, what we found, actually, the best treatment, the most effective treatment is glyphosate, uh, but it works best when you apply in springtime when there are two to four inches of new growth. As the plant, as you progress through the season, the plant gets more and more tolerant of the glyphosate. So two to four inches of new growth in the spring, put an application on, plan to be back on that site in about four to six weeks with a second application. Make sure you're doing about a two to four percent by volume with the, uh, the concentrate, the glyphosate concentrate of at least the 41 percent or greater percent active ingredient. Not the products mixed with dicot or scythe, just the straight glyphosate formulations. And we have compared generic and the uh, manufacturer's products like uh, Roundup Pro Max, and we do see a slight advantage to the major manufacturer's products, the uh, uh, Roundup Pro Max or the uh, Touchdown Pro. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe. Um, how about what's the best control method for dayflower? Glyphosate, this, this question asker says glyphosate does nothing and finale stunts it, but does not completely eradicate it. Dayflower is tough. And, uh, and what I, I have found is you've got to catch it when it's really young. Uh, glyphosate will work if you catch it when it's really young. Basagran will also work. So Basagran TO will work. Uh, but remember, it's going to continue to germinate. So you want to think about uh, not just knocking it down, but keeping new ones from coming up. And to do that, you want something that has a little bit more power behind it. And something, if you can use SureGuard, so a glyphosate plus SureGuard application will provide pretty good uh, control of emerged plants and suppression of new plants from coming up. There are a few other products that work fairly well on day flower, not quite as good, are, uh, are a tower and pennant magnum as a pre-emergence. Uh, but uh, seedling, young seedling ones, uh, Bassagran TO, um, or and, and what Phil was talking about is making sure that you use the right surfactant with that. That's going to be really important in getting Bassagran to work on it. So catch it when it's young, but put down the post and a pre. Okay, great. Uh, we have a quick question for Phil. Um, you mentioned that $400 average annual um, landscape bed weed control cost. Um, this person's asking what what's average. I know you said it depends on you know bed sizes, but can you talk about what might be average? Yeah, I saw that question and I just uh, glanced at our, our price sheet. And between 
1,500 square foot of beds to 2,000 square foot of beds would fit into that price category of about $100 a visit. Um, he, the question is asked about an average lawn, and I think he means average landscape bed size. And so we're not, we're not worried about the size of the lawn on this program. In this program, we're only measuring the landscape beds, and 1,500 to 2,000 square foot of beds would fit in about $100 per application for us. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Joe, there's a question I don't entirely understand, but you might be able to speak about it. Um, with the application of glyphosate and diquat, does this immediate burn? They're asking about um, burn. <laughs> I don't know if you saw right. that one. Can you address that? I know exactly what they're talking about. Yes, this this is a product, when it first came to market, I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. Roundup requires almost two days to get from the leaf to the root tips. And it takes six hours for the Roundup to absorb through the cuticle into the living plant. But then you put Diquat or Scythe with it, and they burn the leaves off within a day. Counterproductive was my first thought. Now, we've tested it. And what we find is there's not really enough diquat in that mixture to, uh, to really burn the leaves completely, but they just make them a little bit ugly, uh, and the customer sees that it's working, but it doesn't burn so much of the leaf that it reduces the, the glyphosate absorption uh, in most weeds. So if you're spraying an annual weed, those combinations, you, give, you get good customer satisfaction and good weed control. But if you're going after a, a rhizomatous weed like bindweed or mugwort or you've got some Bermuda grass there, my advice is to go with the straight glyphosate because you want to maximize the translocation. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another one that came up now in the chat box and that also came up in the pre um, in the registration questions that we we asked was uh, talking about ground covers this question specifically is asking how to kill wild garlic selectively in ground covers but ground covers in general came up a few times in the in the pre-registration questions can you talk about that Joe yeah and Phil jump in anytime from your experience here as well uh, ground covers I always try to say this is a this is a place to start clean and stay clean because they're they're a real maintenance nightmare once they get really weeded weedy. So um, wild garlic in particular, there's really nothing that is truly effective for wild garlic growing out through a ground cover. Get in there and grub it out from the bulb. Make sure you get the bulbs and, and get it early in the season before they produce bulblets. And do that every spring, every time you see wild garlic in there. No easy answer there. I wish I had a better answer. Um, yeah, I'll, Phil, I'll, have you I'll, had I'll, any uh, success? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, and jump in just on ground covers in general. A couple of things that we've found to be effective is, one, Joe talked about, like, for example, on ivy, there's that they're much more susceptible uh, to weed controls early in the season when they're pushing out new growth. After they've hardened off for the year, if you've got an infestation of grasses and weeds in a ground cover area, you can use a very, very light glyphosate um, application over the top to clear out some of those things. This is a little touchy, so you have to make sure that you've got the, the some of the ground covers have to be well hardened off, and over the top you can spray a half percent Roundup or glyphosate application, uh, glyphosate with no surfactant uh, would, would then, uh, it'll hit the most susceptible weeds and grasses, grasses being the most susceptible to uh, glyphosate, and leave the ground cover okay. Uh, you may singe a little bit of the leaves, but that's one technique if you've got a real bad situation that it's either okay, I have to rip the whole bed out, or um, I've I have to try something else. This is a great last-ditch last, last ditch thing to just do a very, very light glyphosate um, application over the top to get rid of 
some of the easier to control stuff like grasses and some of the broadleaf weeds. Um, the other thing we've done is if you have a problem like thistle or wild garlic or something like that in a, in a bed, in a ground cover, going to the customer and saying, look, we're going to try some, some products here that are going to maybe have a little bit of collateral damage around that, but we're trying to stop an infestation from getting worse. Your ground cover could fill back in, and if, you, if you're pulling something, a lot of times, like I mentioned before, you're going to encourage new growth of it, especially in something like a thistle or something that has a bulb like wild garlic. So it may be a better solution for the customer to say, look, I'm going to spray something on this, a real high concentrate of, of uh, glyphosate with a surfactant, and it may have some collateral damage around the plants that you want to keep, but those will grow back, and you've, you've solved the problem for the future before it gets out of hand. And, and I'd add to that, don't forget about wiper applications. Um, yeah. That, that any time you have a weed in a ground cover bed, and that weed gets taller than the ground cover, you can wipe that weed with glyphosate. And when you're doing a wiper application of glyphosate, you use a fairly concentrated amount. Um, and that would be a 1 to 3 or, or a 1 to 1 dilution. So you're, you're using fairly concentrated, excuse me, a 1 to 2 or a 1 to 1 dilution of Roundup in water or glyphosate formulation in water. Um, so those wiper applications can be, can be quite useful. Um, my experience with wild garlic is they haven't been great. They haven't been great. But with other weeds, it works beautifully. Be careful with that concentrated solution of glyphosate, a little bit of dripping, can can get onto the lawn, a little bit of dripping can get onto your landscape beds, and as you can imagine, a little bit goes a long ways. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. And we've gone already 10 minutes over, so I'm just going to ask one more question. Um, this could be for Joe. Does okay. SureGuard have any post-emergent activity on young weeds, or do you have to include glyphosate with it? And also, does temperature affect its post-emergent activity? SureGuard definitely has post-emergent activity all on its own. And so on young seedling broadleaf weeds, so if you have some, some little uh, uh, bittercress or chickweed or some ground sole seedlings coming up in the bed, the SureGuard will take those out and leave a residual, leave a pre-emergent residual in the soil that will keep them from coming back. If you have... Um, perennial weeds like a dandelion, the SureGuard might, will burn the leaves, but it's not going to really control it. So you really, it works better with the glyphosate in it because you're going to get the grasses, you're going to get the, the perennial weeds, but also the annuals and leave the uh, residual. But if you're putting your pre-emergent treatment out, if you're using some SureGuard, uh, it, it does control those seedling broadleaf weeds that, you know, if you see them there, you don't necessarily have to add the glyphosate. And temperature-wise, uh, of course, post-emergence herbicides are generally more active in warm uh, weather, but uh, I found the SureGuard works in, in cool conditions as well. You know, in the 50s and 60s, it still works. Jason might be able to comment on that as well. Well, that's what we've seen, Joe, is that really, uh, even under cool conditions, it's really consistent post-emergence control with SureGuard. Okay, great. Well, I'm not going to take any more questions just because we've gone almost 15 minutes over. Joe or and Phil, would you each like to um, say anything else real quick before we wrap up? Phil, go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think we covered it pretty well. There's so many little ins and outs of this business um, and this application side of things that it's a constant learning thing. Thank goodness there's guys like Joe's out, Joe out there doing the, the testing all the time and getting us more information and people like Valen creating new products for us because it's an, it's a, it's a, you are always learning, always having to find a new the solution for a, another problem that you didn't have before. So it's a, it's a great challenge and it's job security. <laughs> I'll echo that. Weeds in landscape beds is job security. They're going to be there every year. And... Um, 
you know, I, I hope that uh, some of what we presented today will be useful. And uh, if you need more details, I gave the synopsis, but I teach a whole semester-long class on this. The entire class is content is on my my website. So if anybody wants a lot any more detail, please visit my website. The information is all there.